Hi, I'm Rick Barron, and I'm here to give another RAF5 talk. Today, I want to talk about thymectomy in myasthenia gravis. Thymectomy has been around since the 1930s for myasthenia, but all the data we had up until recently was large retrospective series, such as this one by Perlo, published in 1971, which did seem to hint that thym patients who had thymectomy may have done better with their myasthenia gravis. Dr. McQuillan summarized all of the large retrospective studies up until 1977 in this paper published in Neurology, and he was really the first to raise the question, does thymectomy really work? Because when he added up the response rates in the surgical and non-surgical groups, it seemed to be about the same. So when I was a fellow with Dr. Jerry Mendel in the 80s, he actually put this thought in my head that maybe thymectomy really doesn't work for myasthenia gravis. And I thought about this a lot in the 80s and 90s. Tried to get a study started when I was very young. Didn't really happen. But what did happen is Gary Gronseth and I put together a practice parameter on thymectomy in myasthenia gravis. And this was published in 2000. And we looked at all of the uh, non-randomized, non-prospective literature up until that time. Uh, and with Gary's help, we were able to make some uh, assessments on this, and we concluded that it did appear that remission and improvement was a bit higher in the th patients that got thymectomy in these studies. But there were a lot of problems with these studies um, because they were retrospective uh, and, uh, and non-randomized. And we recommend that at that time, or randomized controlled trial. Fortunately, John Newson Davis and a group of co-investigators uh, started that trial. Uh, the, the, the primary investigators in the trial were John Newson Davis, Gil Wolf, Dr. Cutter, Dr. Kaminsky, and a cardiothoracic surgeon, Dr. Jaretsky at Columbia, New York, who really had a passion about trying to get to the, uh, an answer to this question. This trial recently was completed. It uh, was funded by the NIH. It required that a patient have acetylcholine receptor positivity. It, re uh, it required that all patients go on a similar prednisone dose. They had to get a transdermal thymectomy versus no thymectomy. The follow-ups were done by blinded evaluate evaluators. The patients wore turtleneck shirts so that they couldn't see a thymectomy scar. And the question was, uh, 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 with, to try to answer whether or not thymectomy worked, what was the prednisone dose and the quantitative myasthenia gravis score at three years? And, and, and we're, the, the question was, do thymectomy patients do better uh, uh, than prednisone uh, treatment alone? So this was a study that was very difficult to recruit for. It took a long time, but they finally reached the recruitment goal. Uh, 126 patients were recruited, and this paper was just published in New, New England Journal a couple weeks ago with Dr. Wolf as the first author. Here is a picture of the New England Journal uh, Medicine uh, paper, and here is the data. This is the primary data that was shown in this paper. So the top is the QMG score, and the bottom is the prednisone dose. And for both of these primary endpoints, uh, you can see that there is a separation and the patients with thymectomy had overall a lower QMG score and a lower prednisone dose, and this was maintained throughout the three years of the, of the study. It is interesting that most of the effect is seen in the first several months, um, but the statistics show, uh, uh, show that the primary endpoints were, uh, were positive. There were also a number of secondary uh, endpoints that were looked at as well. And this sort of corroborated what the primary endpoints show. So uh, overall, patients um, uh, who had thymectomies had a lower MGADL at the end of the study. They, fewer of those patients used azathioprine uh, and IVIG. And uh, more patients were in minimal manifestations, and they had fewer MG exacerbations. So my conclusion uh, with regard to thymectomy and MG at this point is that now we have a controlled trial that exists. And it, is, uh, it has been published, and it's a positive study. I still tell patients that the response may not be immediate. And in fact, they may not have a response at all. And there is no guarantee for improvement. But we do have this one positive study. Uh, there are numerous procedures. Everyone in this study had a transdermal thymectomy. 
You can see the list of procedures listed uh, on the slide. Uh, and uh, while Dr. Juretsky was very passionate about transdermal thymectomies, at this point, I actually do not specify what type of surgery they have. And if they want to have a less invasive surgery, uh, I'm fine with that. Um, the, uh, I still don't recommend uh, thymectomy for pure ocular patients. I don't recommend thymectomy for very young children. And I don't recommend thymectomy, thymectomy for the elderly. Now, I used to say that was for people greater than 60. But now I think it sort of depends on how old the treating neurologist is. So that's my summary of thymectomy for myasthenia gravis. And I hope you've enjoyed this REF5 segment.